Well, that I mean, to me, I I, re I developed the Phoenix Public Arts mm -hmm. Plan, which started in the early '80s, which was, you know, essentially Phoenix becoming a city away from being a resort community with Mayor Terry Goddard. And the idea was, how how can we create a city that where people really want to live and they value it as a city? And we said actually with a friend of mine who's the head of Phoenix Public Arts Pro uh, Public Phoenix Arts Program. And I grew up in California. I said, well, you know, the desert is about infrastructure. It's about canals. It's about mm -hmm. highways. And, you know, grew up in L.A. and all that. And the, the thing is, people don't value as, as you know, the, mo the, the most incredible investment in culture around. I mean, it's every nickel and dime we have is essentially represented in, in our infrastructure. That's who we are. And he said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, essentially, interest you spend you know, 60% of your budget on stuff that's gray that everybody votes on that's in their backyard. And he says, oh, I understand this. This is about voting. <laughs> I said, so how can you, you know, get a red ribbon every day somebody turns on the water and the garbage is picked up? Mm -hmm. So we, we, we got a percent for art tied to every infrastructure budget. It was a two sentences written into a bonding issue in 1984 for a billion dollars, which was actually real money then. But it was just in there, so it was implanted in there. So it became routine of everything, that infrastructure, and we and the key was the public works director. He said, "I don't know what art is. I don't know what design is. I get the idea that public space should be made every time we do public works. What I really get is that people understand what I do every day, and that is try to keep the desert filled with garbage." I said, "Okay, <laughs> you said it way better than I did," and so it, it became that agenda. And you know, every conservative Republican mayor from there hasn't been able to kill this project mm -hmm. because everybody says this is the way we do it. And the problem is, is that one side you said you have a quick turnaround where developers are trying to make a market because there is no market, so they're trying to catch the two or three percent that might be out there. On the other side, there's a really huge opportunity for, for institutions changing now to re represent themselves from healthcare to public space in the city to, you know, even living. Uh, the problem is, is the development community hasn't switched. They, they still think we're in a recession. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Somehow all the cash is coming back, mm -hmm. or they're picking up the last 2%. But it's really interesting to start seeing when this shift happens. And I don't think it is a competition to do the city of the future, which we tend to follow into in architecture, which is buildings. but. What can the making of the public environment do for us to generate another, another economy or another kind of way of valuing relationships? And I think your museum talks about, or the High Line does it. It's, it's not just a high-end thing. I mean, it's done a great job for the meat market district. But I have to say, I've never seen such a cross-section of ethnic people and economics and everything else just going you know, we're elevated, we're walking in the city, and, and it's, it's open, which is rare. And that starts with that client, who was somebody who loved the city, but not the city, so. But you're, the, the, how many, I mean, are these developers mostly international, where they, you, or just anybody? They come, they come from all walks of life, honestly. We talking earlier about, uh, situation you know like the office he's working for they seem to be picking up one marvelous job after the other well, your public work though. yeah Mostly. and we're yeah, sitting we're here and you know saying oh man how do they do this what's the magic what's the phone number we had what no we idea the phone? city had any work oh, like that. but there are not many of those those are all bond oh, issues that are in place so well, no developers I'm sure any architect or anyone who's in the industry knows that developers are, they're there, they're just yes. everywhere, you know, and it's just replacing it. And nothing wrong with developers. Yeah. We had great developers, really great developers, people we really like to work with. The Medici's were developers. Correct. <laughs> exactly. Correct. <laughs> Correct. And, you know, maybe yeah. even some royal courts of way back when, maybe the yeah. church or so, you know. But yeah. the point simply is if a developer just, sticks with his program and says, you know, I do that in order to right. make money, 
it's not happy. It's not a happy thing, you know. If he doesn't understand, I mean, they make concessions. Yeah, but they're they say, short-term you know, and long-term th- developers. They're, unfortunately, more of them are short-term. They used I to know. be long-term developers. I know. But this is this is, this is 10 a and little bit of a hard so have, you, have you noticed a shift in the last, I don't know, 10, 15 years towards valuing architecture as a kind of... Oh yeah, yeah. Branding I mean, strategy. oh, we have we yeah. have seen it. I mean, we're changed? just right around the corner with these three. Yeah, your yeah. Right? yeah. Those I mean, were that, hot. Those were really hot, and uh, you know, I have to be careful what I say. But you know, they're three nice glass towers, right? Very three nice. Three nice glass towers. Yeah, yeah. And that's the end of the story. And Martha's <laughs> in one of them. <laughs> <laughs> now, why they're hot suddenly? Because marketing was good maybe they just build a hole they just address the issue what i can't really tell you my maybe response the, when i the saw boom, it, it was there white and bright and not dark and brick <laughs> it wasn't a warehouse it was like you what think, a relief you think that was the first class apartment building in new york city no it but it was the first before. small boutique right? wonderful white tower on that side of town in a kind of warehouse brick world it's i, I mean that's why i like frank gary's uh mm-hmm. Um, yeah. PVS building. I yeah. mean, I really yeah. like that. Yeah. I mean, it's a really it's nice building. Thing. But it's on, no one decided to go loft, warehouse. It was sort of like but bright still, and wonderful. Okay, we yeah. grant you that. Luminaire. We're still trying to figure out what happened because that was the question. <laughs> right. We grant you that. These are nice buildings. We know we like them too and everything. But it's almost like once these things were done, you could see them pop up all over town <laughs> like little mushrooms. Yeah. yeah? And it, it was just a weird thing. It was a very weird thing. They were not even site specific anymore. They were just like, okay, we're doing all glass now. You know, yeah. it, it's strange stuff, very strange stuff. But that was also that time where the developers could take a parcel and do 12 condos and oh, be yeah. able to make it oh, yeah. pay. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Which oh, yeah. is oh, it, it all worked. the hyper worked. financial balloon. It all worked. <laughs> right. right. That's, that's what's missing now. And yeah. now, it, interesting enough, I don't know. Now they're into real money. Yeah. Then they were speculating now, for two years. Now, if you see what's going on in town, you know, yeah. the, the bright, transparent, open glass building, they don't really seem to happen anymore. They're starting yeah. to be these dark yeah. towers. <laughs> for cost reasons. Or you could yeah. say for cost reasons, yeah. but, you know, that glass is not more expensive than dark glass, you know. Uh-huh. So it's almost. Oh, 